Well, good morning and welcome again <clears throat> to our online Bible study that we call Your Kingdom Come. The theme is taken from the Lord's Prayer where Jesus taught us to pray, Your Kingdom Come, Your Will Be Done on Earth as it is in Heaven. Do you see what God wants, what His will is? He wants us to operate the world just like Heaven is operated. And that would be in justice, in righteousness, in peace. And you could go on and on, in love. So the kingdom of God, he wants us to be a part of making that a reality in the world in which we live. And it takes all of us working together to do that. Some people are in the limelight. You see them. You see them on television, on the internet. Some people you just see in your community. Some you see in the workplace. So, but it, it takes every one of us doing what we can and what the Lord has placed on our heart to do. And so our subtitle today is Loving Service. And we're going to be pointing out just what I was talking about, that it takes every one of us to make this work, not just a few. You know, I think it just came to my mind about what Paul said. Some people are the eyes, some people are the ears, some people are the nose, some people are the feet. But it takes all of us to make up one body. Right? So we all have a function or a role to play in the kingdom of God. So we're, our scripture, just a short scripture, Luke chapter 8, verses 1 through 3. And this is really um, in the early stages of Jesus' ministry. So it said, uh, soon afterward, he went on through cities and villages proclaiming and bringing the good news of the kingdom of God, and the twelve were with him. Now the twelve is talking about the disciples, Peter and James and John and Andrew, etc. They were, they were making their rounds, if you will, or their circuit. So they didn't have people coming to them. They went to the people. So they were the evangelist, if you will. So they were proclaiming and bringing what? Good news. The good news, what? Of the kingdom of God. That's what they were doing. The good news of the kingdom of God. That we can make the kingdom of God a reality in the world in which we live. That the Messiah is here to set the captives free. Verse 2, and also some women who had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities. That could be infirmities uh, mentally or it could be physically. And then it begins to name Mary called Magdalene from whom seven demons had gone out and Joanna, the wife of Cusa, Herod's household manager, and Susanna, and many others who provided for them out of their means. All right, so Luke here, and we're just going to focus in on the uh, last couple of verses there where Luke is recording a, a small group or a small list of women who accompanied Jesus as he proclaimed and brought the good news, the gospel of the kingdom of God through the cities and villages of Galilee. And we're going to highlight three of those women in just a second. But again, I just want to emphasize that it's the gospel, it's the good news of the kingdom of God. That's what he was bringing. It was setting the captives free. The spirit of the Lord is upon me. To preach the good news. That's what he had said. He quoted from Isaiah 61. 
to open the blind, the eyes of the blind and open the ears of the deaf. And he came to set captives free, no matter what was going on in their lives, to bring a transformation so that people could live whole, well, and at peace, not only with themselves and other people, but with God. It's good news. We don't need to be spreading bad news, but we need to be spreading the good news of the kingdom of God. And we should be making and bringing that into reality in every sphere of influence in our society. That there should be righteousness, justice, peace, love, etc. But let's look at these women. The first one is Mary Magdalene. Now, we hear, if we've read the gospel writers and we've read the story of Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection, then we know and we've heard about Mary Magdalene, right? We really don't know a whole lot about her background other than what it says here is that Jesus cast out seven demons. Now, there can be different types of demons. There can be demons of murder or demons of lust or demons of pride or demons of hatred or demons of jealousy or you know, there's a lot of, you know, and um, there's demons that are very evil. So there's different kinds of demons that can possess a person. It just depends. But it doesn't detail what those demons were. And the fact that, you know, here Luke is documenting that she had not one demon, but seven now, we know the story about the man, we don't even know his name, that was the demoniac at Gadara. He had a legion of demons. There were so many, you couldn't count them. But here specifically, Luke is detailing that this woman had seven demons. Now, we don't know what kind of demons there were because... Like I said, there are different types of demons. And it, it's all based on people's weaknesses. You know, if, you're, if you have a tendency towards a quick temper, anger issues, well, then that demonic spirit can play upon that. And it can create a, a spirit of murder or violence or anger you know, out of control anger. Or it could be lust, perversion. So there's many types of demons. I just wanted to point that out. Uh, well, the name Magdalene probably comes from the fact that she came from a city around the Sea of Galilee that was called Magdala. So most likely that's where she came from. This is where Jesus was ministering in and around the Sea of Galilee, so that's probably why she was identified, because usually you don't have two names. It's Peter, James, John, it's, you know, it's Mary, but it's, this is Mary Magdalene, to, you know, because there were several Marys in the Bible, and so this kind of distinguishes her, and probably by proximity, where she lived. But anyway, after Jesus cast the seven demons out of her, she became one of his most loyal followers. Now you think about the demoniac in Gadara. <clears throat> when Jesus cast the demons out of him, and there were a lot of demons on this man, uh, he was a violent man. They couldn't even chain him. He could break the chains. So, you know, we don't know what, what all kind of demons that he had. But when he was delivered, he wanted to go with Jesus too. But Jesus told him, no, go back to your hometown and tell them what great things the Lord has done for you. But he didn't say that to Mary Magdalene. She was allowed to accompany him or be, you know, to minister to his needs as he was 
going about his ministry, he and his 12 disciples. Now, some have just speculated that because Luke mentions first mentions uh, Mary Magdalene after chapter 7 in which it talks about a sinful woman there who was anointing Jesus with a very expensive ointment, they link Mary Magdalene with that woman. But I think as much, uh, you know, Luke is such a person that is very detailed oriented and, and he likes to document facts. I think he would have mentioned that somehow or other that she was linked to what was in chapter 7, the woman that was there. But this is just speculation. We don't know for sure. So there are some that think because, you know, he it was just talking about in chapter 7 about this other woman or this woman with that was anointing Jesus with this precious ointment that they were the same people. But that, again, there's no evidence to support that. That's just circumstantial evidence, if you will. It wouldn't hold up in a court of law, put it that way. Um, so Mary Magdalene is nowhere identified as a prostitute or, you know, as a sinful woman. She did have demonic uh, demons. She had seven demons on her, but you know there can be people in church. I've heard many stories of people that said that they had to deliver people in church from demonic spirits. It could be a religious spirit. It could be a jealousy. It could be you know anything, but it doesn't detail what those demons were that she was delivered from. We're just making some assumptions here. Also, she's also associated with the woman who was um, caught in the act of adultery in John chapter 8. Some people want to link her to that woman. But again, there, there's no you know, defined evidence. That would just be an assumption. You know, in the trials in the Senate this week... They've been pointing out the testimony of the ambassador that they were talking to, and and they said, do you know for a fact that this was true? And he said, no, it's just my assumption. So he didn't have the evidence. It was just his assumption. Well, that assumption can be wrong. We can jump to the wrong conclusion. But you know, in the Passion of the Christ, that's the connection that they made there. They were associating Mary Magdalene with the woman that was caught in adultery. Well, she could uh, have a demon of lust. I don't know. It doesn't tell us. So, again, this is just an assumption. It's possible, but it's not taught in the Bible. It's not defined. So, again, Again, if you don't have all the firsthand evidence, if you don't have the documentation, you can't say for sure that that's true. Anyway, Mary Magdalene, because she was so, you know, she was just so glad, so happy, so filled with joy and love for Jesus that she did become one of his most loyal followers. And she witnessed most of the events, if not all of the events, surrounding the crucifixion and the, you know, all, most of the things that were going on with the resurrection. She was there at the trial of Jesus. She heard Pontius Pilate pronounce the death sentence. She saw Jesus beaten as he was whipped and humiliated by the crowd. She was one of the women who stood near Jesus during the crucifixion to try to, you know, provide encouragement, comfort to him, letting him know, I'm still with you. I'm still here. I still love you. I still care for you. I'm not going to turn my back on you. If you look in Matthew 27, 
Here's what it says. There were also many women there. This is at the crucifixion. Looking on from a distance. Well, they wouldn't, you know, the Roman soldiers wouldn't let people get too close. So they couldn't see. I mean, they were there, but at a distance. Who had followed Jesus from Galilee. There were many women, not just her, but there were many women that followed Jesus from Galilee, ministering to him. Among whom, and it lists, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Joseph and the mother of the sons of Zebedee. So here she's listed with some other women who were there at the crucifixion. There were also women, uh, this is Mark's account, Mark 15. There were also women looking on from a distance, not allowed to get cl that close. The Roman soldiers wouldn't allow them. Among whom were Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James the younger and Joseph and Salome. And when he was in Galilee, they followed him and ministered to him. And there were also many other women who came up with him to Jerusalem. So it seemed like there was an entourage of women who accompanied Jesus and the disciples. They came all the way from Galilee down to Jerusalem. Most of the time, Jesus spent his time in and around Galilee, but during the feast days especially, Jesus would go to Jerusalem. John's gospel said, but standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. There again, John. So Matthew, Mark, and John are all including Mary Magdalene there at the crucifixion of Jesus. And then the earliest witness to the resurrection of Jesus was Mary Magdalene. And she was the one that was sent to tell the others about the fact that he was alive. Now, first let's look at Matthew's account in Matthew chapter 28. Now, after the Sabbath... That's from Friday sundown to Saturday sundown. Towards the dawn of the first day of the week, that would be Sunday. Mary Magdalene, she's the first on the list, and the other Mary. So that was to help distinguish because otherwise you'd be say Mary and the other Mary. So Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake. For an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and the clothing, his clothing was white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here for he is risen, as he said. Come see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And behold, he is going before you where to Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. So they were to go quickly and tell the disciples that Jesus was risen from the dead. So the women departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. Behold, Jesus met them and said, Greetings. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brethren to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. So they saw they were the first witnesses of the resurrection. Now look at John, what he says. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples. So she was, you know, there may have been other women with her, but she was the voice. She was the one that made the announcement. She announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. She was an eyewitness to this. And that he had said these things to her. So she shared what Jesus had told her to say to the disciples. So that's the last mention of her in the Bible. 
but probably she was with the women who gathered with the apostles in the upper room waiting the coming of the Holy Spirit that we read about in Acts chapter 1. And specifically, we'll look at verse 15, but first, verse 13. And when they had entered, they went up to the upper room where they were staying. Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus and Simon the zealot and Judas the son of James. And all these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer together with the women and Mary the mother of Jesus and his brothers. So they don't give a whole laundry list of the women but there were women in that upper room as well, as well as the mother of Jesus and the brothers of Jesus that were there, or the half-brothers. So that was Mary Magdalene that, was, that we saw in our text. The next person that is mentioned is Joanna. Now, she, according to Luke 8, 2, part of our text, she was one of those women who had been healed whether from evil spirits or some type of an infirmity or disease or something had happened. I mean, Jesus had made a tremendous impact on her life. Uh, she accompanied Jesus and the 12 disciples on their travels as they went about from town to villages, and she helped support the Lord's ministry. And it tells us that she was the wife of Cusa, the manager of Herod Antipas' household estate. So she was most likely a woman of means and influence. So here, along with Mary Magdalene and Susanna and some others, here was Joanna, who helped provide food and supplies for the missionary team and from her own resources, from her own wealth. Now, we don't know what the circumstances were in her life, whether she'd been set free from a demon. It didn't say that she'd been demon-possessed specifically, or whether she herself had been healed of some type of affliction. We're not exactly told, but we do know that she was wholly devoted to Jesus unto the very end. She traveled with him, on his final journey from Galilee to Jerusalem, she was present as a, at his crucifixion and burial, and she remained there with the other women who had prepared spices and burial ointments to anoint Jesus' body at his death. And we read in Luke 23, it said the women who had come with him from Galilee, well, she was from Galilee, and she was following him. And she saw, and they saw the tomb and how his body was laid. Then they returned and prepared spices and ointments. On the Sabbath they rested. That's from Friday Saturday, uh, sundown to Saturday sundown. They rested according to the commandment. But then on Sunday, first light, they were there. And upon discovering the empty tomb when they got there, she and the others ran to report the news to the apostles. She was part of the group of women that saw the resurrected Lord. So in Luke 24, now it's Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary, the mother of James, and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. So she was one of the ones that is specifically mentioned by name, she and Mary Magdalene, that, you know, these are the ones that are, are in our text. They were the ones that gave the report of the resurrection. Now, Joanna is mentioned in the Bible only in the Gospel of Luke. Now, her husband, we're told, he was... Herod's uh, steward, Herod Antipas' steward, 
or manager or treasurer of his income or one who was in charge of the domestic affairs of a family. Just like, remember in the Old Testament with Joseph who was in Potiphar's house. He took care of all the affairs of the family. He took care of the expenditures, the income, all those things. Made sure that everything was taken care of. So Joanna could have lived in Tiberias, which was the capital of Galilee, if her husband had that position with Herod Antipas, because that's where he ruled from. Some speculate, and again, this is just speculation, that her husband may have been the nobleman of Capernaum, whose dying son was healed by Jesus. If that be the case, the fact that Joanna became part of this ministry team to Jesus and the disciples, that could be the reason it would be out of an overflowing gratitude for what he had done for her son. He was, If he was the dying son and Jesus brought him, you know, gave him life, then you can understand the mother's gratitude for what he had done, the miracle he had performed for her. I don't, we, again, this is speculation, but could be. But the fact that she was the wife of a man in Herod's employ is ironic because Herod, you know, he, he was there at the crucifixion and, you know, he was, he was wanting to see some miracle, but he wasn't a good guy. Herod was not a good guy. And Joanna, no doubt, she had to step down from her aristocratic social position when she chose to follow Jesus and associate with his disciples. Can you imagine that? That her husband was working for a powerful man in the government. And here she's following around this itinerant rabbi. So what was going on there? Now, after her conversion, Joanna traveled with Jesus, served him, learned from him, financially supported his ministry. So some scholars believe that Joanna may have been a key source of much of the detailed information that Luke included in his writings about the life of Jesus. It's possible. She could have. We don't know that for sure. But the fact that Jesus welcomed women like Joanna into his inner circle, well, look, that broke with Jewish tradition and the strict social divisions of his time. You know, you just didn't do that. Here was a married woman here in first century Judaism, this was considered scandalous for women and especially a married woman. She was married. But she had to have the support of her husband to do this. So there must have been some, you know, very special intervention in their lives to make them willing to do what they did for her husband to allow her to go with Jesus and to be part of this group of women who were ministering to Jesus and the disciples' needs. So, you know, this just breaks down all the social barriers and prejudices, the class barriers. She had, her husband was working for a very powerful man, and yet here she is part of a group of women following around this itinerant teacher, rabbi. So, again, these are all speculations. There's little that is written about Joanna in the Bible. But just the fact that she's mentioned, that her name is mentioned. Think about the many people in the Bible that it would say, well, this man or this woman, and it wouldn't even give their names. But her 
name is listed. Now, I think that's significant that she would be mentioned by name. She's not just the woman that was called in adultery. She was not just the woman who had the issue of, of, of blood. She was not, you know, this blind beggar. She was, you know, we don't know their names, but we know her name specifically. So she had the privilege. Think about this. The privilege of being one of the first people to share the good news of Christ's resurrection. That was a great honor and a privilege. How many people got that privilege? And for her name, there were other women's, but women that were in that group, but she specifically, she and Mary Magdalene were mentioned. So here she was a loyal and a generous follower of Christ. So it just goes to show that the kingdom of heaven is open to whosoever will. Whosoever is willing to give their lives in humble service to Jesus and to other people. The third person that's mentioned in our text is Susanna. Now, the only thing about Susanna was that we know was that she was one of the women whom Christ healed or delivered. And out of gratitude, she was following him and ministering unto him and to his disciples of her means, of her substance. There were many others, it said. There were many other women who provided for Jesus and his disciples out of their means. These were the key behind-the-scenes people who helped to make Jesus' ministry possible through their substance, through their giving, through their ministry to him and his disciples. I imagine doesn't detail it out, but what do you think these women were doing? Well, they were doing what women do. They were cooking. They were cleaning. They were feeding the men. They were sewing, patching up where something was torn. They were providing clothes. They were probably helping to find places for them to stay for the night. Or if they didn't have a place to stay, then they would make, you know, preparations uh, somehow for them to stay warm and dry or whatever. I mean, they they were just a team of women working together to take care of the needs of these men so that they could devote their selves and their time to ministering to the people's needs. You see, there's a lot of behind the scene people that it goes that goes into ministry that you never know who they are. They're unnamed a lot of times. They're not the ones in the spotlight. But if they didn't do what they do, then those that are in the spotlight couldn't do what they do. Those that have the microphones and the lights and the staging and the parking and the, you know, helping people find seats and all these things, if you didn't have all that, you know, it takes all of a, a, a team to make things work. All we see is the one that's on the platform. We don't see all the people that are working so hard for hours to make it possible. They never get the glory. They never get the praise. They never get the thanks or gratitude for all that they do. And yet, they're as much that they're as important as anyone, because it takes all of us doing our part. Well, more than that, the women, their love, their encouragement, their loyalty, their prayers, their commitment. Well, this provided Jesus and his group of men the courage to persevere in the direst of circumstances. So let's look about let's think about Peter for a minute. This is after Jesus' resurrection, and Peter um he's arrested. 
He's arrested. They're wanting to stop this Jesus movement. And they had already executed James, the brother of John. They had already executed him. And Herod thought, well, that's a good idea. I think I'll get Peter next. And so Peter was facing execution, but happened to be at a feast time, and he didn't want to do it. Herod didn't want to execute him during that time. That wouldn't be too, too cool. But he was put in prison, and he had 16 soldiers guarding him. But how was he delivered? Well, in the middle of the night, an angel appears to him in his prison cell and helped him to escape. Now, Peter thought he was dreaming. He didn't think it was real. But then suddenly, when the angel disappeared, he realized, hey, this is true. I'm outside of the prison. I'm outside of the city. So what does he do? Look at Acts 12, verse 12. When he realized this, hey, this isn't a dream. This is real. He went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose other name was Mark. So went to the home of John Mark, the mother's home, where many were gathered together and were praying. They were having a prayer meeting, praying for Peter, and they had their answer. So we may never know all the names of the women who helped and supported Jesus and his disciples, but the point is, Jesus knew. And in a day and age when women were not highly esteemed, he honored them by making sure that they were mentioned in the word of God by name. You say, well, look at their background, though. Well, yeah, look at your background. Mary Magdalene was especially honored to be the first one or one of the first ones to see the resurrected Lord and to be the first evangelist to proclaim the good news that Jesus Christ is alive. She saw the Lord. This is what it says in John 20, verse 18. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And then she shared what else he had to say to them. She got to tell them the good news. That Jesus was alive. That he wasn't in the tomb. The tomb was empty. What a, what a privilege that she had. What a privilege. So here's the final word. From Colossians 3, one of my favorite verse. Whatever you do, put your whole heart into it as if you were doing it for the Lord and not for men. Knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. We may be the behind the scenes person that nobody ever knows about. But it's very important what we do. Every person is important to the Lord. Everything that we do, if anything matters, everything matters. Everything matters to God. Don't think that it's not important. Everything matters to God. If you smile at someone, if you're kind to someone, that matters to God. He records that. He says, look what my children did. I'm proud of them. He's got our picture on his refrigerator. I'm just, you know, kidding there. But just making a point that he loves that. Anything that we do for him, to honor him, to give him glory, the Lord loves that. And maybe we don't get our names in the billboard or the highlight or, you know, we're not the ones that are up on the platform performing, but 
Everything that we do matters. All the little things. A kind word. A word of encouragement. Can make all the difference in the world to some people who are struggling. And these women, I mean, that was a lot of encouragement to Jesus. To know that they were willing to give up their personal lives and, and follow after him and, and minister for him and to him. That was a big deal. So I thank the Lord that he knows. Other people may not know, but he knows. So put your whole heart into it. And don't do it to get recognition from people, but do it just to bless the Lord. I will bless the Lord at all times. How do we bless the Lord? It's by, you know... If you've done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, you've done it unto me. When he sees how we treat one another and take care of one another, he says, you're doing that to me. So God bless you. Amen.